welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I am Sarah McDooling and my colleague Shamia Prasad and I are very excited to be talking to the amazing Lily Wilkinson. Hi Lily. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Um, now, you have a book shortly to be out called The Erasure Initiative, which both Shanu and I have just read. Excellent. Yes. Would, would you mind telling the listeners a little bit about um, this book? Sure. Okay, so it's a YA psychological thriller that's set sort of just very slightly in the future. Um, and it is about a girl who wakes up one morning on a self-driving bus Um and there are seven people on the bus. It's going around and around uh, in circles around a deserted tropical island, and nobody on the bus has any memory of who they are or how they got there. And they are trapped on the bus, and they have to figure out who they are and why. Okay. Now, this is... Shana and I were talking before the podcast about how to approach the delicate danger of spoilers in a discussion about this book. So we thought, if it's okay with you, we will keep a very spoiler-free discussion mm-hmm. for up until a point where we clearly telegraph we're going to be talking about spoilers. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so basically your setup sets the parameters about plot stuff we're allowed to say, right? Because anything more than that, I feel, is danger zone. Um, <laughs> so like, yeah, I mean, I, I I am happy to give away like the first couple of chapters. Um, right sort of spoiler free and then afterwards like it gets pretty crazy yeah. <laughs> it, it's a very fast moving book this one like I literally like that beginning is so grabby and um and then there's never a break like there's no sort of I think the there's one point in the book where there's a bit of a regroup but so many revelations are happening at that point that it's um action wise slows down but um intensity wise never stops until the end yeah how how do you pull that off (laughs) it was something I did really with a uh, like really intentionally because I realized very early on that the problem with what is essentially a locked room story with these sort of seven people who are stuck in on a bus together it can get boring really quickly because the setting doesn't change none of them know who they are so they can't tell us interesting anecdotes about their past we can't I can't deliver exposition through their backstories at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was afraid of it getting boring and losing narrative traction. So I very, very carefully plotted it. So in every chapter there would be a big twist and a big reveal. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely worked because I started reading it and um, then I finished reading it and I hadn't done anything (laughs) else. (laughs) um, I think what we've done there was successful. (laughs) Excellent. Um, did you find it challenging to be getting, because I one thing that I found amazing, like after the I finished the book, because I didn't have time to think about this stuff while I was reading, I was too engrossed. But after, I was like kind of amazed by how you're able to so clearly get across character when they all don't know who they are. Yeah, it was a lot harder than I thought it would be and I kept sort of catching myself um, sort of writing bits where the character would start to tell a story about like something their father told them and I'm like, oh, no, can't do that. (laughs) And it was quite hard. And so one of the things I sort of tried to do was sort of take, create characters who sort of start off as quite archetypal, sort of characters who seem to be a very particular type, you know, like there's the handsome jock and... Um, and sort of like there's that spiky girl with the shaved head who's angry all the time. And I tried to sort of start with some very, very clear kind of almost cliched archetypes and then sort of peel back those layers as we went on to make them more complex. I think that was um, quite, that was quite, uh, yeah, really helpful uh, to, um, to actually also make the reader sort of get a really good sense of, as you said, nothing, no, nothing's happening really outside. It's the same scenery, the same scenery, and there's no driver on the bus and the bus is just you know it's a bus we all know what one looks like Mm. but um yeah I think that definitely helped get a really clear picture of all the characters um uh in our heads as readers at the beginning which makes what happens later even better I think yeah I I hope so I'm glad to (laughs) (laughs) because 
biggest fear with the whole book is that's like, you know, can I pull it off? Like, are people going to realize what's going to happen? Are they going to guess all the twists or, you know, almost worse, are they not going to guess the twist and then for it not to make sense when they do get there? Um, Like balancing all of that was a lot harder than I thought it would be. You did it so well because I honestly did not have a spare moment to sit and wonder what was coming. And that's, I think, when readers know, guess a twist, it's because they've got space in their brain to try and figure it out. Mm. I was too, I was too enthralled. And, um, and then the, the brilliance of a really good twist is that when you get to it and it's revealed, suddenly all these little things that came beforehand, which were clues, but you didn't realise, make sense. Like, yeah. yeah, like that's a great feeling. And I, you didn't just do that once in this book, you did this multiple times. Yes, it took a lot of, yeah, of like it was like a jigsaw puzzle trying to put it all in place. And then every time I moved like one little bit, it, you know, everything else had to be reshuffled while I tried to figure out who knew what and who remembered what and who is who. Um, yeah, I had a lot of little diagrams up on my pin board and lots of note cards to try and keep track of it all. Did you, um, did, was this a, a different way of writing for you from, because you've written lots of so many different books um, in the past and, you know, great YA books you know, very, very cute picture books, but the, the YA books um, <laughs> all been, have, all, have all been very, very different from each other. You know, you, you're definitely not an author that you could pigeonhole into one specific, you know, genre or type of uh, YA novel. Yeah. So do you find, uh, was this the most difficult book you've you've written from that, that kind of plot point of, that character point of view, or did you enjoy bits of this that differently to how you've written other books yeah, I think that it, I don't think it was the hardest book I've written. Um, that's the book that I'm currently writing. Um, <laughs> I can't wait for this one then. <laughs> yeah. But it was certainly the most strategic I've been about the plotting of a book. Like I do like to plot. Plot is definitely where I live. You know, I love thinking about plot. The plotting and planning of a book is always my favourite part of the process. But with this one, I think I was much more kind of rigid in the plot because I think that the sort of the style of the book demanded that. Um, So I didn't let myself sort of go off on digressions. I tried not to make it too... Um, like descriptive in a lot of places like I just needed to keep that narrative tension as tight as I possibly could for the whole way through and I don't think I've ever kind of gone about writing in such a kind of like a strategic way before I'm sort of really really trying to keep control of it and not let the story go off and and not being able to do um, exposition and memories is makes that very easy because there's nowhere you can go (laughs) kind of like the bus yeah Yeah. like the bus um, it's such an interesting idea for a book. I feel like was there, you know, do you remember your first little spark of inspiration for this one and, and where it came from? Yeah, I do. And so this is a funny story. Um, the, I, the, the fantasy book that I'm writing at the moment is something I've been working on for like 10 years. And after, after the lights go out, came out, I went and sat down with my brilliant publisher, Jody from Ellen and Unwin and, we sat down and we were talking and I said, I really, really want to write this fantasy book that I've been wanting to write since, you know, I've always wanted to write fantasy since I was five. Like, this is the book of my soul. And she's like, great, it sounds really good. And, you know, we're definitely interested in publishing it. But, you know, after the lights go out, did really well. So do you think maybe you could write another thriller first? <laughs> um, and I sort of very grumpily went home and I was very mean to my family for a few days um, <laughs> and I started to make lists of what kinds of thrillers I might like to write. I was just trying to find an idea that felt sparkly enough that I wanted to do it and I knew I wanted something that was just sort of a little Black Mirror-esque, like something slightly futuristic. Yeah. Um, and But I couldn't really come up with anything. And then, like, you know, this is the cliche of being a writer. I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I just had this image of a girl in a vehicle. I think it was a car back then, a self-driving vehicle, and that she has no memory of who she is or how she got there. And that was a really kind of grabby image for me. And I wanted to spend a little bit more time trying to figure out, um, you know, who she was and how she got there. And so then I went and sort of started reading about memory loss and I read this memoir called The Answer to the Riddle is Me. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is a memoir by a guy who basically woke up on a train station in India one day with no memory of who he was or how he got there. Um, And the book is about his very, very long uh, kind of road to gaining his memory back at the spoilers 
it turned out that he lost his memory as a side effect to uh, malaria medication. Oh, wow. Yeah. I remember uh, hearing about this. Yeah, it was on a um, This American Life podcast as well. Yeah. And he lost his memory for over two years and he had no autobiographical memory. So he kept all of his semantic memory, his, um, his general knowledge, but he lost all of his sense of self. And when he started to learn about who he was, he realised he didn't necessarily like that person very much. And I thought that there was something really kind of poignant about that, about if you lose yourself and then find it again, what happens if you don't like that person? And so that was a really, really big driver for kind of what I wanted the book to be about. It's explored so well in this book as well. And it's such a fascinating, the idea that, I don't know, like it's almost like there's, you have, you're born with certain raw material, Mm. but you can develop into like, that raw material could develop into any number of different kinds of people. Yes. So if if you're able to like, if, it, if it's your experiences that shape your raw material and you can get rid of those experiences, you could, you could build again differently, but still with the same basic core. And I guess that's the question, isn't it? Yeah. How much, like how much of it is you? <laughs> how much of it is your experiences? It's a, it's a, it's endlessly fascinating and it is mm. really like a Black Mirror episode now that you've mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> And so I did a lot of sort of like thinking about memory. I watched quite a lot of documentaries um, about memory and about nature versus nurture and all of these sorts of different things. There's a great documentary on Netflix that I have forgotten the name of, but it's about two brothers, one of whom gets into a, a motorcycle accident and loses his memory when he's about 20. And he has a twin brother. And when he comes so when he comes to in the hospital, he recognises his brother and he's like, that's my twin brother, and he remembers nothing else about his life. Wow. And the only thing he knows is that this man is his twin brother. But the, the the way the story develops is like his twin brother has to decide, well, how much of their life and their childhood does he tell him? Does he let him think that they had this lovely, happy childhood or does he tell him the truth? And oh, so yeah. it becomes this really kind of moral quandary for him. Um, and, like, that was really fascinating to me. I'm just sort of fascinated by sort of all of those really ethical grey areas and, like, how do you make those decisions about your life and other people's lives? Oh, uh, yeah, that's definitely something that's really come through um, in this book and also your, I think your last couple of books as well have really, I remember reading um, uh, the, I'm going to call it the wrong name, anything with more than two words in the title and I always get a confused the bound of the supply. supply. Yes, that's yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's the one. Because okay. uh, I remember the book very, very well. I just titles I'm not very good at. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Particularly if it's a, you know, the, the thing of something and something on my own. Yes, exactly, oh, yeah. exactly. And then I make everyone else say the title wrong too if I say it wrong enough times. It's, um, <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> um, but in The Boundless Sublime as well, you have these, like these like the whole time I was just, the, the entire time I'm thinking, oh, would I do that? Or what would I do that? Or maybe I would do this. And then, and it's like, oh, and then you really could see how someone could get into a position like that and, um, you know, try and work out how to get out of it. So I think that's really interesting that, um, you know, and there's not a lot, I mean, that, you know, there's so many amazing YA books out there, but I really find that uh, in your books particularly, I really find myself thinking ethically a lot more about a lot more things than I do in a lot of a lot of other books. So I find that really interesting that that's something that you're, you know, you're, you're really uh, um, keen on, like, imparting to everyone else is those yeah. questions. Do you have answers to those of what you would do or are you are you happy to leave the questions there and just be thinking about them? I think it depends. Like there's some time, like with um, After the Lights Go Out, like I wanted a lot of characters to have to make very morally ambiguous choices where I don't think there is a right or a wrong, no wrong answer. Yeah. But then there are other characters like the father who I was like, well, he's just wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was, that was a person I'm glad I've never met in real life. Yeah. But I really like that and, like, I find it frustrating sometimes in literature sort of those those absolutes of this is a good person or this is a bad person, like, you know, that there are absolutely no Slytherins who come and fight um, <laughs> against <laughs> Voldemort. Like, you know, I don't like that idea. I don't like moral absolutes. And something I did for my PhD thesis, I was looking at um, the ways in which young adult fiction is making young people more kind of engaged in activism and politics. And one of the findings from my research was that in books that that promote a very specific political ideology, teenagers do not respond to them with activism. The books that make teenagers 
sort of engage in activism are the ones that are morally ambiguous, the ones that allow young people to uh, sort of interrogate their own ideas and that ask questions that they can answer themselves that are not didactic. So I'm really interested in that and I think that that's really important um, for young people is to give them the questions but to allow them to come up with their own answers. Oh, that's so fascinating. I, and I do, I agree with you, Shano, that is probably like, um, you know, Lily might be a hard author to pin down what genre-wise because you change a bit mm. from book to book, but that is a real common quality that I hadn't put my finger on, but that it's really true. Um, yeah. I think it's there in all your books. Yeah, it's something I find really fascinating and, like, and I think it comes out of a, like, a memory of me, like, a, as a teenager, I never liked being told what to think. Um, but it also comes out of like, you know, a genuine respect for young people who I think are more than capable of, uh, you know, um, coming up with their own answers and their own ideas to life's problems. Oh, absolutely. I, as I was reading it, I was just thinking, oh my goodness, can you just imagine what a discussion about this book would be like in, in a, you know, in like, in like high school? Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh my goodness, it would be, you'd, you'd have to be, yeah, it would be very, very interesting. Mm, um, definitely. And um, yeah, as Sarah and I were talking because you know we're the uh, you know cause the book's only only out on August fourth. We're <laughs> we're uh, lucky to read it early, so uh, couldn't talk about it with anyone else. <laughs> um, and so yeah, even, even we were debating about oh, well, I'm not sure if I would have been you know I would have agreed with that or that's how I would have felt about that particular part of the story. Yeah. So um, yeah, even just the two of us together. I feel like I want to move into the spoiler zone. Is it too <laughs> early? <laughs> No, I think I think we have to. I think I think we need to because I think otherwise we're going to accidentally spoil something. Yeah, um, fair enough. Okay, um, so listeners, I want to flag that although personally I often talk about how I don't care about spoilers, I truly feel that if you have not read the book, now is the time to stop listening because um, this book would, I think, it would be such a shame to know what was coming because the twists are so well executed. So honestly, um, listen to the podcast up to this point, go read the book and then um, come back and listen to this spoilery discussion in three, two, one. Spoiler zone. And then they all get abducted by aliens. <laughs> <laughs> and they woke up and it was just a dream. <laughs> and- uh. Yeah, can, none of those can we talk about the amazing electrical dynamic between Nia and Cecily from like the first moment? <laughs> yeah, I love those two together. Oh God, it was so well done. I feel like even if the book had not been had so had such a like unpredictable plot with so much action happening, I would have been transfixed just by those two. <laughs> was it? What what? How was it for you to write a romance, you know, where you had someone who, where you have a couple who are already a couple and don't know it? It's like such an interesting dynamic. Yeah, I um, I really really enjoyed writing their romance, and it developed. I think I knew. Oh, it's hard to remember now. I think I knew fairly early on, sort of what their dynamic was, um, and what their history was together, um, and I was really interested in um the kind of. Like I love a like a you know like an enemies to lovers kind of trope. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the best of times, and then this is like a lovers to enemies to lovers um, <laughs> sort of very confusing, twisty thing. But I I love the fact that they are just you know absolutely drawn to each other and and but also hated each other. And I really wanted to explore like with Cecily, I wanted her to be like an obnoxiously privileged character. Like I wanted her to be perfect and white and rich and uh, smart and beautiful and sort of all of these things Um, and then to explore what happens when you're all of those things but not a good person Um, and for her to have to confront that, for her to make assumptions that, that, you know, that a lot of people make about privileged people, um, about herself, to think, well, I'm all of these things so I must be a good person Um, and then discover that she, she isn't. Um, and then sort of to have the opposite of Nia of, you know, that everybody assumes that she's not a good person because of the way that she looks um, or the things that she does or the, the skills that she has. 
um, and then sort of to sort of flip that on its head a little bit um, and then sort of just smash them together and see what happens. Oh, it's so well done. And in you, fact, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Then I go, Sarah. Um, I was just going to say the whole Blue Fairy, like, backstory is so fascinating. Like, I just, it, how hard was it to put through such an interesting story that I would have literally read a whole book just about the backstory? Um, yeah. But you had to weave it through so, like, delicately, like, Imagine that would have been quite hard. I kind of wanted to go live in that backstory and I'm just reading it. Yeah, it's <laughs> quite hard to put to know sort of how much to put in, so to, to put in enough that you understand what the story is, but then not to just bombard the reader with a sort of unnecessary exposition. Um, and with those, the little interstitial bits in the book, um, I find that like in when I, I have not, it's not something I've done before. And when I've read it in books, I either love it and <laughs> I can't quite figure out why, except for the, it is a matter of narrative traction. I think it's when the traction drops, um, then I don't want to read it anymore. Um, whereas when it is increasing the narrative traction, that's when, like, I'm like, yeah, give me every little bit and let me try and piece together this puzzle. So it was about trying to keep them as short as possible whilst still conveying everything that needed to be conveyed um, and doing it in an order, hopefully, that, that sort of just adds little bits and pieces, but yeah. with every piece of the puzzle that gets connected, there's sort of another bit of the puzzle that is revealed that asks more questions. Yeah, oh, definitely. Because I was, I was, I, I really spent the entire uh, book as I was reading it trying to be like, okay, so I think maybe this is what's going to happen. And then either getting that little bit of extra information, I'm like, yes, I was right. Or being like, damn, didn't get that bit right. Okay, next bit. And then, <laughs> and then seeing if I was like, if I was understanding where you were going or if I was um you know completely down the wrong path and I actually I actually found that those um those little extra bits of um uh you know outside information as they're downloading I was like those bits were fantastically put into the right spots that um that as you said like helps you uh like progress the story but without ruining what's going to happen ahead of it it just gives you more information on what something has a new line on something that you thought you knew yeah. and I think that's one of the best um uh you know parts of it is that even at the end you still don't know if you know what you think you know <laughs> no oh my yeah. god the ending is a whole separate discussion <laughs> anyway, I do you have a clear idea Lily in your mind of because there's a lot left to the reader to yeah. kind of figure out themselves or like yeah. wonder about and, that, and I love that and that's perfect but I always wonder when I read a book where things are kind of you know, what really happened at the end, does the author know? Like, do you have? I mean, I know. Okay. Yeah, is I it do. something that you want to put out there, like what your um, I, don't, I don't think so. Just for, if not, for, for, like, just for the only reason that um, I like ambiguity at the end of stories and I like that it, whatever you think, that's what it is. Um, it, you know, right. if it doesn't belong to me once it's out, yeah. it belongs to the readers. And so they should get to decide what happens in the end. I will say, however, that the the final image of the book, um, that not the last little interstitial bit, but the final moment of Cecily and Nia was an image that I had in my head. I knew that that was going to be the closing image of the book um, for, from like pretty much the beginning, um, but I had no idea of how I was going to get there. Yeah, so yeah. that was sort yeah. of the challenge of the book was to manoeuvre the plot and the characters to get to that point where they could they could take that leap. I was beside myself because I really, up until the moment that it happened, I really didn't think, I thought somehow they would not be wiped. Like I just thought, I was like, surely, surely it won't happen. And then it yeah. happened. And then it, and then everything happened. And yeah. I wish so much. Like I obviously am deciding as, as, the, as for myself, as the reader, that they got to have their imagined life together mm -hmm. with their secret money and that everything is great. And <laughs> wonderful and perfect. That's yeah. <laughs> I think that's fair. Excellent. Um, Excellent. It, it's almost like I don't know if anyone, I'm probably the only person left that watches this show, but I watched this uh, TV show, Blind, Blind Spot, for like, I don't know, went for five seasons. <gasps> and She's an uh, amnesiac, right? She has no memory. Yeah, it's another one that talks about memory and she has no memory and, and you know, it's, it's it's another really interesting dilemma kind of um, show. And right at the end, if the... Uh, they made it go two ways where either she dies right at the end or 
she lives and everyone and everything's really happy right at the end. And apparently that shows you something psychologically about people as to which one they believe because they oh, feel right. in a way that either of them could be equally true. And that's kind of reminded me of when I when I finished the book yeah. at um, one o'clock this morning. I was like, I was like, what? No, no, but but um, no. <laughs> that's the beauty of those endings, though, because part yeah, of you yeah. it goes like, realistic <laughs> and says, oh well. But, or pessimistic, I guess. Part of you is like, oh, well, you know, they're dead. Yeah. But the other part of you, because it's not sure, the other part of you rises up and is like, but wait, <laughs> maybe not. I, yeah, I actually yeah. really love an ending like that. Yeah, yeah, I do as well. And I don't love an ending where every single loose end is wrapped up. Like, I want to be able to spend some more time with that story on my own as a reader. Like, yeah. I want to be able to take it where I might imagine it to go. And so when you tell me, like, who married who and who had children with who and what their jobs were for all eternity, like, I feel Boring. like <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like you've taken that from me. I, talking yeah. about Harry Potter, I kind of wish that I'd never read <laughs> very very end of that because I was like I didn't need that I was very happy just finishing at the end of you know whatever that story was and I'm I've been known not to like watch second or third seasons of shows if I really like the um cliffhanger ending of the yeah. book. Yeah I know I love that so, link you took straight to the Harry Potter um, yeah. love that. that was funny. Well, I mean you know and, and so I really appreciate that you that you did that ending and I think I, and I think even people that do like a neat ending and there are lots of people that do prefer books that have a neat ending. I think they will still find enough in the ending that to satisfy that part where yes. you need to have some sort of closure. It's not like one of those ones where it like, you know, and and then it finishes like mid-sentence with yeah. like literally anything. Yeah. Um, it definitely had some. So I really appreciate that part of the structure mm. of the story. And I'm, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure lots of people will as well. I, the other relationship that I thought was really um, interesting was you know, there is the, the the love story between Cecily and Nia, but there's also that that kind of very strange relationship she has with Paxton. <gasps> oh my gosh, yes. Where it's like, and it's really interesting because you you know you talk in the in the book, it's like you know she's it, it's like a comfort thing for her. It's like, um, but there's still real desire there, and I thought that was really interesting. You don't see that explored a, a lot, even in books where you know the the character might be interested in. Um, you know, uh, multiple people. It just, it, it was really, I've really found that that, um, that was really very true to kind of like a sort of a, 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 you know, an experience of like you can be attracted to multiple people for different reasons at yeah. the same yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and I feel like, like, you know, you hear a lot of, again, absolutism uh, around on the internet of like all love triangles in literature are terrible. And whenever I hear anything like that, it, like I just it feels like a challenge to me. Um, and I was like, well, what if we made one that was a bit more interesting? Like, like it's just boring love triangles that you don't like, and that's fine. Um, but what if I could make one that felt a little different, that felt sort of interesting narratively, that wasn't just you know about you know a beautiful girl trying to choose who she pick? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's not about who she pick, um, yeah. but it's more about who she is. And I yeah. think that, um, yeah, that that dynamic was really interesting to me. And again, to sort of start with that sort of really cliched image of these two beautiful, perfect white people having their beautiful life together and then just sort of peeking it apart at the seams to try and figure out, well, why exactly is she in this relationship and what does she get out of it? And um, and all of those sorts of things were really fascinating to me. And then I really wanted to sort of present the reader sort of in the beginning of the book with this perfect on paper relationship between these two rich, perfect people, but then to really make the reader be rooting for an entirely different, much less conventional relationship. Oh, and oh. it was perfectly done. And you and you do pick the whole thing apart, but then you explode it at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> and that is a perfect example of the thing that we were talking about in the spoiler freeway before we hit this zone, mm -hmm. um, where as soon as a twist would happen, it was almost like your brain would supply the clues that you didn't even notice at the time. And so, like, the way that with Paxton where, you know, you've outlined how memory works and he recognised Cecily and he recognised his mother. And so we should have known. Like, that should have been a, a warning bell. But it, yeah, it, it really wasn't, wasn't <laughs> because I was just too deep in the story. I was just, like, completely lost in the story. So when yeah. it happened, it was like end of the sixth sense where you get all the flashback scenes yeah you're like oh it all makes sense now <laughs> um well that's an enormous relief uh to hear because 
you know, you just never have any idea. And that's, you know, that's exactly what you want as a writer when you're writing a thriller is you want like when the reveals happen, you want the reader to go, oh, I knew that, but I didn't know that. Like I had all of those pieces of information. Of course, that's the answer. Um, so that it 100% makes sense, but then yes. you didn't quite get there on your own. Like that's what I want. Um, yes. And it's Me too. <laughs> very difficult to pull off. Um, but with that, with that particular thing about who recognizes who, that actually was something that came in very, very late in the process oh. because I realized at one point that because they all have their general knowledge, the Blue Fairy is famous enough that some oh. of them would have yeah. general knowledge. Yeah, of right. Her. And so I had to figure out a way to incorporate that. Like that was something I just genuinely hadn't thought of until, you know, six weeks before publication. And so then I had to kind of, yeah, put all of that stuff, sprinkle all of that stuff in. And then it ended up being quite good because it led sort of that trail of breadcrumbs towards the final uh, kind of reveal about Paxton. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I, I didn't just, see any of them coming. I didn't see Katie <laughs> Bell coming. I didn't see the Blue Fairy coming. I didn't see any of it coming. It was all like the best kind of twists for me. Yay. Like, That's the best news. <laughs> <laughs> and and she was such a good um talking of uh Ketterbell, such a great villain that's like like a villain but also you can kind of see where she's coming from mm. <laughs> and you yeah. do have to ask those questions so it's again it's another layer you don't just get the ethical dilemmas of the main like of Cecily and her ethical dilemmas um or the people you get you know all the just even the people that are you know surrounding her on the bus that are like her mm. but also from the other perspective and you can imagine why people might want to do you know what they did to um uh, to try and make that work because you can yeah. imagine how that could be a good thing, except then also how clearly it's probably would never work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I love a villain who thinks they're a good guy. Like, um, you know, like even Thanos in Avengers, I think is a much more yes. villain than just like, you know, your average Voldemort who, you know, is fairly one dimensional. Um, yeah. And so I really, really wanted the villain to be someone who, you know, was doing what they thought was important, but perhaps maybe doing it for slightly the wrong reasons. <laughs> um, uh, early on, it was a man. Um, and ah. I was just like, I often stop and look at when I'm planning and look over everything and just ask myself, how can I make this more interesting? Like, what could I do to make all of this more interesting? And in fact, um, uh both Cato Bell and now I've forgotten my own characters and Sandra were both Sandra. men. It was a male politician, uh -huh. male sort of scientist. It was ba you know basically Elon Musk. Um yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, well, it would be more interesting if one of them was a woman. And so then I tried to figure out which one and I was like, wait, why does only one of them have to be a woman? Yeah. <laughs> but, no, you know, so says they should all be women and yeah. <laughs> uh, so I changed all of that. Um, and then that made everything much more interesting. Um, just because Absolutely, because that plays with your idea of, you know, gender and what people are supposed to be like and what they are like um, yeah. as well. Whereas if you made them men, I think it would have been maybe you might have picked up a little bit earlier potentially on some of the some of the things. But yeah. by making by making her, you know, have just had a baby and all this kind of there's all this kind of stuff going on that you just like, yeah. And so when it comes out, you're just like, well, did not expect yeah. that. Yeah. It's so interesting to even hear that you – originally had them as men because the way they ended up um being women is sort of intrinsic to both characters like yeah. you might not have overlooked a doddering old man in quite the same way that you would overlook a doddering old woman like yeah, yeah. it made it so much easy to hide her yeah. um and it made the reveal a lot more fun. And then that character, there's a really great uh documentary called Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. Um, which is an HBO documentary um, that is about a woman called Elizabeth Holmes who oh, yeah, of, oh, yeah. yeah, this incredible <laughs> woman who basically um, in Silicon Valley who, who came up with this invention that she hadn't actually invented yet mm -hmm. um, of, of something to do with blood testing. I can't actually remember what it was, but got this extraordinary amount of funding and, um, and support from all of these incredibly powerful men, these incredibly powerful politicians and other scientists and got this extraordinary amount of money um, for this invention that she had not invented and she kind of strung everybody along for such a long time but it's not that she was a con artist like it wasn't that she couldn't do it or that she knew that she couldn't do it it was that she genuinely believed that she could do it 
she, she brought her own, um, yeah. she brought into her own like myth. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and so I found her really, really interesting um, and complex and sort of tried to inject Kato Bell with a little bit of that as well, that kind of absolute 100% conviction that what she is doing is right. Well, and you get the sense in the book that um, Kato Bell and Cecily are kind of cut from the same cloth. Yes. They both have that incredibly powerful personality that is so charismatic that um, they can kind of make things happen. It's just that they they do it differently. Like Cecily is happy to uh, not have the personal glory Mm. um, and just make all the things happen behind the scenes. Uh, whereas yeah. Kato Bell wants to be front and centre. But I really enjoyed their interactions as well. Yeah, I really enjoyed writing the relationship between them um, of, of two people who are sort of so similar but in, in these really kind of distinctly different ways um, and how they kind of hate each other but also hate the way that they see each other, like they see their own reflections in each other. Yeah. And the, the, the lipstick just yeah. I, <laughs> was such a powerful <laughs> Thing when she took the lipstick and you and put on the lipstick, yeah. That, um, and then when Nia's like, that does not suit you, and you just, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I like that. That was yeah. that was great. And also, I, I could really imagine that really strong color of lipstick on a blonde person not looking so good. <laughs> no, it looked terrible. Um, it would look very nineties, a real nineties look. That <laughs> very very much. Um, uh, oh, this will be um, what's her name? Courtney Love. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a real kind of yes, a grungy, gothy Courtney <laughs> Love era. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not really Cecily's style. Not so much. <laughs> but yeah, I really um, that as a power play as well of sort of um, looking yeah. at some of those expressions of femininity and sort of like seeing how you could make it a boss move at the same time. Yeah, so good. Well, there was that great moment towards the end where Kato Bell's like driving madly behind the wheel, and like it's a very tense part of the story but still there's a moment for the characters to just admire how like amazing she is in her yeah. in all her glory like <laughs> yeah and that's the thing it's like I kind of admire her as well um I think she's amazing because she is powerful and she is smart and she's an incredible scientist it's just she's a little bit too obsessed with her own ideas of what things should be like to the extent that, you know, like like a lot of very powerful people has become not very good at listening to other people or not very good at self-reflection or introspection. Yeah. Uh, we could talk uh, about this all day. We like, really could and I really wish we could. Many warnings <laughs> that we are going for a very long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've, we've had the call twice that we need to wrap it up so reluctantly. Um, Lily, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. All mine. And uh, listeners, you can get Lily's new book, The Eurasia Initiative, on and all of her other previous books um, at booktopia.com.au. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au dot au